I'm here to introduce all of our panelists to you. So first is Dale Haddon. Dale is the founder and CEO of Women One, an internationally recognized nonprofit focused on creating quality education for girls globally. Partnering with Duke University, Women One created leadership workshops and award-winning film programming for Syrian refugee girls in Zatari Camp in Jordan. Dale has been the international spokesperson and the face of L'Oreal, Revlon, Estee Lauder, and Max Factor, the only person to have four major cosmetic contracts. Amazing. She's written two international best-selling books on inner and outer beauty and living in balance, bestsellers in both the U.S. and in China. She has been regular, a regular contributor for CBS television, The Early Show, as well as being a beauty and well-being expert. So welcome, Dale. Thank you. Linda Freed. Linda P. Freed, MD, MPH, is the Dean of Columbia University Male Men's School of Public Health since 2008. She additionally serves as Senior Vice President of Columbia University Irving Medical Center and Director of the Robert N. Butler Columbia Aging Center, a university-wide center housed in the Mailman School. Dr. Freed is a physician expert in geriatric medicine and an internationally renowned population scientist with the goal of creating and distilling the science base for successful societies of longer lives. She co-chaired the 2002 2022 National Academy of Medicine Report, Global Roadmap for Health Longevity. She was named among the top 1% most influential scientific minds of the past decade by Thomas Thomson Reuters in 2014 and by the New York Times as one of the 15 world leaders in science in 2012. And I'm telling you, all these people, we could stay here all night if I read you everything. <laughs> All right, Lucas Hauser, is he coming? Come on, Lucas. All right, Lucas Hauser <laughs> has edited several HBO documentaries, The Blacklist featuring, featuring Toni Morrison and Chris Rock, which he edited, won an NAACP Image Award, and screened at the Sundance Film Festival. Lucas has an MFA from Columbia University and is principal of a production company, McConnell Hauser, based in Los Angeles and New York. Following Below Surface, he produced the 2024 feature documentary, Camp Rickstar, about a unique music camp for people with severe disabilities. <coughs> All right, so Lucas. <laughs> Mary Lake Pollan. Where is she? MD, PhD, MPH. She served, as, served as the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Stanford University School of Medicine from 1990 to 2006, and is curr currently a clinical professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at Yale University School of Medicine. She has a longstanding interest in women's health research and has been actively involved in international public health. While at Stanford Medical School, she initiated the Etrian Women's Project in 2001 and has maintained this surgical project in Etria to repair fistulas resulting from traumatic births. Recently, she has been interested in the biologic basis of healthy longevity and executive produced this award-winning sh short documentary film, Below Surface. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. What a panel, right? We can't go wrong tonight, so. All right, Dr. Panel, so, Dr. Panel, there we go, right? <laughs> Dr. Pollan, okay, so when the film opens, we hear you say that what is unique about this swim class is that it strips the body of all things like clothing that tell others who you are and reveals the soul. I know this project came out of your personal experience with the swim class. Can you explain what intrigued you and why you felt with the tip of the hat to Sigmund Freud that sometimes, a swim class is not a swim class. 
Well, it, that's an easy question to answer. I swim. I had been swimming every day for years. And <clears throat> suddenly, um, after having hip replacement, I dislocated my hip and was told I needed surgery. And I thought to myself, get on a surgical table or do some exercise, which is better, clearly, to exercise. And I watched these aquafit classes at the YMCA where I had been swimming laps. And I thought, this is the, the clear way to strengthen your muscles. And so I thought, I'll try that, and got in the pool and loved it. And what did you discover about the class, though, that was different? The thing about the class that was so unique was that it was non-judgmental. If you think about a woman putting on a bathing suit, you're concerned about how you look and what people are going to think. That class, as you could see from the film, everybody smiled when you got in the pool. And they didn't care if you were old or fat or whether your hair looked good. And I personally have spent my life in academics. And I have never been in a place that's not judgmental like that. <laughs> And especially coming from my perspective, having been in magazines, I mean, that's all we knew, right? So why did you want to turn it into a documentary film, though? Because that's a long way from just enjoying the class. Um, because it was COVID and I was bored stiff. <laughs> I was in Connecticut, and we couldn't come into New York, and it was really boring. So I, I thought about it, and um, we had taken some students from Stanford film students to Eritrea when we, and we made a small documentary film about the project. And I came home one day and I said to my wonderful husband, we should make a film about this. This is a unique situation. And Frank said, sure. <laughs> and so we did. It was really because he was supportive of this. And what did you hope that the viewers would learn? I hoped they would learn that growing older doesn't mean you're old and ugly and incapacitated. That what it means is that you can still go out, have fun, whether you're 68, 78, or 98. And that they would, they would look forward to being healthy and being older. And that we're not invisible when we get older, right? And that you're not invisible. Because we all feel invisible. So Lucas, let's talk about the filming itself. What was challenging about the film for you and what were the risks? I never really cared for the water, I guess. Is, uh, <laughs> uh, That's a problem. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, I, uh, I worked a little bit with Mary Lake uh, uh, before. Um, and I was intrigued by the idea, uh, but I had no idea how to make it something that someone <laughs> would would really uh, connect with. I mean, you know, if you're said, uh, make a film about water aerobics, it 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 it, it's, it uh, seemed like a tall order, and um, we realized um, Judith Bookbinder, the producer of the film, who's here. Uh, who is great at interviewing um, people. And uh, we had also worked together on, on a lot of projects where we realized that uh, she's much better with <laughs> talking to people than I am. Um, and so we, uh, she really elicited uh, things from these uh, participants. And I didn't take long on the first uh, day of filming to realize that uh, this wasn't going to be a film about water aerobics. So um, that was uh, some of the challenges, yeah. Yeah, to make it more than water aerobics. Good. What's your favorite moment and why? Huh. Um, I come to this as an editor uh, primarily. And you know, we, we shot a lot uh, over a handful of days. And um, uh, re-watching it recently, I realized that it's it's nice when the editing can take two very different things and put them uh, in relief with each other. And um, you know, one example of that is a, a moment. You know, we went to go film somebody at their house, uh, walking out of their uh, out of their house and meeting Patty, the remarkable uh, ringleader of this uh, of this program. Uh, that 
that moment could have been chronolog chronologically very early in the film of, of seeing someone get out, but uh, I put it at the end of the film when she's talking about, um, you know, what the class means to her and wh wh what uh, th those people have done for her. So it's an example of a, of a moment where, you know, we're with her and, and learning about her uh, trauma, but uh, using something that's uh, kind of uh, small uh, and very different to uh, illustrate that. Yeah, awesome. Talk a little bit about one of the swimmers says, you're born in water. What's the symbolism of the water for you as a filmmaker? Um, well, it, it, was, it was lucky that, you know, as we started talking to people, uh, that um, remarkable things started being re revealed. Um, I mean, I think it was, again, on that first, uh, the first day of filming that Patty revealed that um, she had this awful uh, experience with her husband's uh, body being discovered uh, in, in the woods. And <laughs> I realized that, uh, wow, this is, um, this isn't what I expected. And, uh, <laughs> you um, thought it was a water aerobics video. Yeah, it was not uh, a water aerobics so video. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's fortunate that water has a, uh, has a, uh, has a, has that line uh, to divide uh, the, uh, the in and the out. All right. All right, Miss Dale. Yes. The beauty world is not kind to mortals who grow old. We know this. In the past, a high fashion model was finished over the age of 30, as we know. The beauty world either pretended women over the age of 40 didn't exist, or they tried to sell us cosmetics with using 20-year-old faces. That was my favorite all the time, was like, I'm so young, yes, but you're 20. It really works. No, it doesn't. You're still 20. <laughs> Recently, we've seen a trend of featuring older women. MAC Cosmetics put 96-year-old Iris Apfel in the MAC ad, um, and designer Batsheva Hay sent 56-year-old Molly Ringwald down her runway this season. Has the fashion and beauty world really changed its attitude towards aging? And how do you see aging portrayed in the media? Aha, uh -huh. so you're right. Uh, I was told by the industry I was finished and over the hill when I was 38. 38? Yeah, okay. so I thought, no I'm not. I'm, I haven't even started. And at that time there was no imaging, very little imaging, maybe some black and white pictures of a, a woman over 40. So I went to the library, got a, did a lot of research, and came back um, very, very positive about the numbers out there, the baby boomers, and um, what we were asking for as baby boomers. We, I think as baby boomers, we will never feel old or grow old feeling. Um, you have moments, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so I came back hitting, and that was in the early 90s. And uh, just because I had done so much research, I became a spokesperson for the different brands. And so it was just so rewarding for me to be signed by Estee Lauder and then L'Oreal after being told I was finishing over the hill. So there is life after. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I think it, it relates back to yourself. And I was asked the question downstairs about the media. Do you think the media creates an impact that we, yes, the media does, but I think it's up to us to check, put it in check, and check in with yourself and say, what is realistic? Who am I? We have a life. Every piece of our life is important. A, a life is made up of a beginning, a middle, and an end. And up until a certain point, the last part was not portrayed glamorously. But I think we make it what it is. And we make it by being plugged in, by being enthusiastic, by being connected, by joining um, organizations like the, the YWCA for things like this, create community and um, re reinforce your own feeling of value for yourself at every age and every stage. It's, it's extremely important to do or the media will tell you you don't have value. So I don't think they're really changing. They're accepting because the numbers um, support it, but I think it's really up to us, and especially as women coming together and defining ourselves about what is fabulous about each age. Because every age has secrets to give us. We just have to find out what those secrets are. Dr. Freed, are our attitudes 
about aging changing at all? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's why we gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that what we now know is changing a lot. I don't know that our public perceptions are changing. And the challenge is that the, the US is now the most age segregated society in the history of the world. And, in, and explain and what in you mean US by that history. when you say segregated. You so, mean? so people who are old and people who are young never intersect, except ah. maybe within the walls of a family. Uh, never is a strong statement, so I'm being overly dramatic here. But um, we have sequentially over the last 75 years segregated people by age in hmm. education, in the workplace, and um, in housing where we live. And so we don't know each other. And the evidence is quite strong that when, when we don't know each other, we actually create tropes. We, create, we accept stereotypes about who each other is based on characteristics. And the strongest, um, the strongest trope we have is actually about age and, and, and is pretty uniformly ageist. And we don't know each other well enough to break that down, which of course is one of the wonderful things about this film, um, that we get some insight into who the human beings are. Mm -hmm. And that the issues of being older are deeply human uh, and not so unrelated to the issues of what being human means, as Dale was saying, at other ages. What I used to say when I ran Mary, not Mary Claire, when I ran Moore Magazine, which was for women 40 plus, is aging is not a disease. You can't outrun it. It's going to happen to all of us. So we gotta, we've got to deal with this. We have to, we have to figure out how we're going to all deal with it because mm -hmm. mm, it's, it's going to happen to all of us. So Dr. Pollan, were you surprised by any of the insights your swim mates brought up in the interviews? Actually, I was. I was surprised <laughs> at how very open and vulnerable everybody was. I mean, how many people talk about a divorce and their husband was mentally ill and then died and they found his bones in the woods? People were, and that's because Judith, who's here tonight, was able to talk to people in a way in the middle of a giant swimming pool <laughs> in the YMCA <laughs> where people were willing to talk about this. And I, that's what surprised me. I've, most people are not as forthcoming as the people in the film were, and they actually talked about what, what made them happy and sad and what was important and what they'd had in their lives. Everybody wanted to talk about the history of his or her life, and that surprised me. I didn't think people would be that open. But you must have sensed something. I did. I, I, the, reason, the reason I liked it was I would get in the pool and everybody would smile and say hi. And that had never happened to me before. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, where everybody smiles and says, welcome. It was a totally new experience. That surprised me. So I guess you're right. It shouldn't have surprised me that people would be willing to talk about it. But it's the only time I've been in a situation like that. And I would like to find more situations like that. <laughs> Can we all make those? Yeah. That makes me so sad that there are so few of those situations, but I know what you mean, because we're all so competitive. Uh, we've been brought up to be so competitive, as, as you were saying. You can't go anywhere without them thinking, what did you publish? What did, you know, what was the next thing? Lucas, one of the issues we have with aging today is that few of us live in multi-generational houses or families, so we have no real idea of what aging bodies look like. We only know airbrush facsimiles such as the 80-year-old swimsuit model, Sports Illustrated, Martha Stewart. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That ruined it for all of us. The moment when you showed Dick Rao in the changing room really startled me. And you showed his skin and you showed everything. And I went, and a lot of us did. Did you think twice about that shot? Was it risky? Uh, there was certainly discussion about that shot. Um, because, yeah, if the purpose of the film is to 
um, spread the gospel of how healthy and uh, wonderful this program is, you might not uh, do that kind of thing. You'd have more of a marketing uh, project. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it, it startled uh, me. And I think the problem is not with the body, but with uh, the media, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what's been uh, a pleasure is to have that image kind of desensitized, uh, at least for me, having seen it a few times now. Um, but um, yeah, it, uh, it's, it becomes, you know, a more normal thing uh, the more you experience it, and that, of course, is a lesson uh, about the, the power of the media. Did you discuss that shot at all? Was there a discussion about whether to keep it in or yeah. out? You did. Yeah, and uh, okay. and there might have even been more uh, more of it that was uh, adjusted a little bit. Uh, so you know, it it it, it certainly is. It was certainly. Um, yeah, kind of a challenge about how to show the world and uh, get you to not um, stand away from him, but to get involved with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, you know, the, the more time you spend with him in the film, I think, uh, you know, it, it works and that you, you get to really uh, feel for him, I think. Yeah, it gets to be beautiful. When I saw it a couple of times and you show his legs, um, I thought it was quite beautiful in the end. Dale, in the film, 89-year-old Barbara Rose says, aging is like finding there's nothing important in your life. How have you coped with moving out of the spotlight as you've gotten older? What do you do to stay relevant? And how do you define importance today? Oh, I don't know if I've moved out of the spotlight in a way. <laughs> Are you still in the spotlight? OK. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, it, I never thought about it. You know, I never really thought about it. I mu was much more interested in connecting to myself of what was I interested in. Do you know, I kind of feel there's a moment where we all come to, at least I did anyway, where you, I, you don't want center stage. You leave that for other people. But I might be in the wings a little bit, <laughs> or I might be, but I want to be interested and connected and making a difference somehow. And in the, coming from the fashion and beauty industry, uh, it was great because you get an education on what is a beautiful woman? What is beauty? What is it really? Is it not having a wrinkle? Is it not, you know, what is it? And it has to come, especially at a certain age, from, and not to be banal about it, but from who you are inside. And at a certain age, you can get away. I say that a beautiful person has a two minute grace period, and then you know they have to deliver. Because the promise yeah. is so huge that if there's nothing there, it's such a shock. So I think that it is um, a meeting with self that where, what is my next incarnation? What will plug me in. I went from that industry, then writing books and talking to women and touring around and speaking to women. Like, what is important for them? How do they feel? What do they really, are they looking for? And the common thing that I found was they felt at a certain age they didn't have value. Right. And so that was really moving to me and interesting. So then what is the value? So what, for me, how I address it is that I just want to be interested. If I'm interested, then I know I'll have value because I'm connected to it. So I moved over into more disadvantaged women and girls with my nonprofit, working with UNICEF and then my nonprofit for girls' education. And it's very connected because all the women, if you're in a disadvantaged place or an advantaged place, we're still looking for the same kinds of things. To be pertinent, to you know, try to voice our best self, to have love and be loved, and find your place and have a voice. And that's now taking everything that I've learned and, and um, assimilated through the industry. And it's given me great gifts, I have to say, that how do I translate that into an importance to a young girl in Africa who has nothing, no running water, no electricity? How do I translate that to her from my privileged life 
to her? How do I support her dreams, her voice, her... That gives me a lot of value. I think they give me more than I give them, you know. But it, it's, it's finding les raisons d'être, the reason to be. Finding your reason to be gives me value and worth, sense of worth. And is part of the aging process because the definition of beauty is also being appropriate and uh, being kind, we talked about this upstairs, and being generous. I think generous Generosity, is another, yep, is another definition of what is a true, beautifully beautiful person. Is somebody that is generous of self and kind and thoughtful you know, to their fellow man and woman. <laughs> yes, good. Dr. Freed, what doesn't the younger generation understand about the aging process? So I think uh, it's the same thing most of us don't understand. Um, so, some of it Dale said before that, you know, the, the good news is that we have created longer lives. We, we created this. We invested over the last hundred years in the conditions that allowed all of us to have the opportunity to add 30 years to our life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So, a hundred years ago, life expectancy in the U.S. at birth, you could expect to live 47 years. Mm -hmm. Think about what we now expect. Um, and then the question, and, and we haven't even absorbed that we created that. And it is, we've added a whole new stage to life. Um, but what we haven't done is build the society for longer lives that we would right. want to live in. Mm. And mm. <laughs> the other thing that we haven't absorbed is what the science now says. And now, now I'm going to sound like a scientist. But, um, <laughs> but what we've learned is that, yes, there, there are many insults to our body that happens after long <laughs> use. <laughs> yep. um, but at the same time, Mary Lake and I were talking about this before. The thing that takes my breath away is that we also, the good, it's a good news story, because as we actually gain capabilities and assets and attributes across these longer lives that we've never seen before mm -hmm. with these extra 30 years. And we've never seen them in bulk, which, which is what we have the privilege to see now when 20% of the population is over 65 and it's going to keep growing. And these assets are something that I think should be cause for great optimism for young people because they're pretty cool. Dale just recited half of them. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the fact that as people get older, the evidence is that they um, actually become more caring and concerned about others, right. develop pro-social goals, have look for meaning and purpose. That's I'm just reciting what you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, are generative in terms of want, you know, feeling the pressure of mortality and, and not being guaranteed. You don't know how many more years you're guaranteed, and you have a pressure to make a difference, to leave the world better than you found it. And on top of that, people accrue other assets. As This is a good news story as we get older. Um, certainly, we know more than we did when we were 10. That doesn't disappear, what we know. Um, when the day you retire, if you retire, you keep learning and growing, and you develop capabilities to, to actually integrate what you've learned objectively in your work, what you've learned, or school, and what you've learned in life experience, and you put them together into this um, integrated framework which creates new capabilities of immense capabilities of problem solving, capabilities for conflict resolution that people don't have as much when they're younger, capabilities for um, balanced assessment of things laden with what you think are, is right and making decisions around that. I could go on and on, but I think that what, um, what we all could treasure is the opportunity we've created of longer lives to accrue these assets. Mm -hmm. and even to develop them. Yeah, right. absolutely. Do you think younger people fear aging at all, or do you think they fear it less since you're involved with younger people? Are you seeing 
they're excited about getting older? Or are they scared of getting older? Scared. I, I think most people in this society are scared, scared of getting older. Definitely. And we equate getting older with death, which we're terrified of, which is very human. Right. Um, and, and so how we appreciate that we've added a stage to human life um, and, and that there are, there's meaning and value and, and contributions that we will all be the beneficiary of because we, mm -hmm. because we have this is very important. And I think, you know, this program that we, you just watched the movie about, I think it exemplifies one part of what we could be building to bring out the value. Uh, to have new kinds of programs that bring us together in social connection, in building um, you know, the basis of social capital, which is trust and reciprocity between people. And you see that in, in spades in, in the movie. Um, and, and having the infrastructure to make social connection, which is at the heart of really flourishing. Right. All right, Mr. Lucas. When using real people to tell a narrative, what do you look for from the people that you are filming? And I teared up when watching the water aerobics video. Um, what do you think that's about? Well, um, again, I'm, I'm an editor, so I'm kind of um, writing with the material that I have, um, visual or other people's words, uh, the visual part was shot by someone who's here, uh, Chris Okonski, uh, who, um, <laughs> uh, got very intimate, uh, with, uh, with them. Um, and, and he had to get in the water often, uh, <laughs> got, uh, very cold. Uh, the <laughs> um, but yeah, the, material that Judith was able to elicit was, uh, again, uh, as I said before, um, was, was just uh, unusually uh, candid that, pe that people uh, were able to do. Not, not always. Um, uh, Patty, and I don't know if Patty's here, but Patty, Patty um, here? Uh, no. she, she really did not want to talk about uh, her her personal story, but um, uh, we felt, or I felt, that it was uh, <laughs> it was essential, and so Mary Lake uh, granted us the ability to keep shooting a little bit more until we um, until we convinced her to uh, to share it, and um, and we wouldn't really have a, a film uh, without that, I don't think. So, yeah. Why do you think, Dr. Pollan, why, do, why am I tearing up at this? And I'm sure a lot of you felt that too. It's, a, it's very I, moving. I think it's, I think it's all based on trust. And the fact that the, the group of people in the pool were nice to each other, and their expectation was that the people filming would be equally nice and kind, and that nobody was out to hurt anybody. And when you're as you say, frightened of getting older, or frightened of anything, you draw back, you pull things in. And Judith and the filmmakers and Lucas, there were about six or seven people there, and everybody was peaceful and kind. And it, it engendered trust in the people in the pool, and they were willing to open up. So I think it's all based on trust and kindness. And so we were seeing kindness, which we don't see so often today, right? That, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, How, that makes me sad. <laughs> okay, Lucas, quickly, a documentary short has to be under 20 minutes. What was your favorite shot that ended up on the cutting room floor? <laughs> so, um, Dick, uh, I, everyone knows him on a first name basis now. Uh, <laughs> Dick uh, was, was fascinating. Um, he, as Patty mentioned, he worked in uh, film and television, actually, which is kind of an interesting um, coincidence uh, or uh, you know serendipity with uh, tonight. Um, he had a 
career. In fact, I was watching a Mike Nichols film recently and saw his name in the credits. So it was kind of a, a, a moment here of uh, worlds colliding. And he retired uh, in his uh, 60s or 70s, which is, uh, was 30 or 40 years ago. And he, like uh, Dale was saying, he found a, something that interested him. And he created a whole new career for himself. He discovered that he was interested in um, drawing plants in a very professional and serious way. His drawings are on the collection of the Brooklyn Botanical uh, Garden. Wow. Um, he got a doctorate in botany in order to do wow. that correctly. Wow. He won awards all over the, uh, the world uh, <laughs> uh, for his you know, first place awards for, for his work. Uh, and we filmed him, uh, Chris filmed him painting and uh, oh, wow. illustrating. And <laughs> it just, uh, for a short film, it, I just couldn't find a way to, that you know, he, he deserves the, to be the subject of a, of a feature film. He, <laughs> he, he did, he did uh, four months ago, he did uh, die at the age of 98. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it is, we're so lucky that we got to spend time with him. And, it, and uh, I do hope, to take some of that footage that Chris shot and, and find a way to share it. So. Amazing. Dr. Freed, last year the Surgeon General wrote a report about the epidemic of loneliness in the United States. And they said that staying disconnected, especially as you aged, is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Take that in. And yet fewer and fewer of us attend a house of worship. We no longer congregate in public squares. We self-check out out of CVS, and we're hoping for driverless Ubers. <laughs> so what are the risks of loneliness for all of us, and what can we do to address them? So a very important report from the Surgeon General last year. Uh, he said we have an epidemic of loneliness in the US. And uh, while most people over the age of 12 in the U.S. are at risk. It's particularly affecting young uh, adolescents and young adults and older adults um, for some of the same reasons and some different reasons. What's the impact? Well, the impact, as, as he laid out very well in this report, you can read it online, um, is serious. It's serious for us as individuals because, in fact, loneliness, which is a feeling, it's a feeling of emotional pain mm -hmm. um, that you don't have the connections that uh, would be meaningful for you. And it, it's been said that that pain is like feeling hunger. If you feel hungry, it tells you to go get some food. Feel lonely, it's, it's how we're wired to tell us we need to find the meaningful relationships that we're missing. And if we don't listen to that feeling, what happens is that if loneliness becomes chronic, it actually causes all kinds of things in your body like inflammation, um, which is, a, and, and many other things, which act like 15 cigarettes a day in terms of being a risk, not just for heart disease and stroke, um, for obesity, and for a host of other physical conditions, but actually creates um, some distortions in our own emotional well-being. It puts people, makes people more anxious, makes them at risk of depression, but it also essentially um, replaces your rose-colored glasses with, to, with glasses with blue lenses. And you start to see a world that you're interpreting through blue lenses, which others would see the same things going on through, through rose-colored glasses. And people who are chronically lonely start to actually um, interpret interactions with others in much more negative ways than oh, anybody wow. else would, which creates a really vicious cycle of, of actually becoming more lonely. So the consequences for the individual, I could go on, but that's enough. But, but the consequences for the individual are not good, but they're not good for society either, which the Surgeon General's report also lays out. 
because the rates of loneliness are quite high. Mm. And essentially, the evidence is that we've, the way we have designed our 21st century world has made the opportunity for loneliness the default option for many people. Wow. It's and we need, if we've designed it in, we have to, as the Surgeon General said, we have to think about how to design it out. And a big part of that is building for the 21st century the kind of social infrastructure that we had in prior uh, parts of the United States history where people came together, in ma as you were saying, Leslie, in so many different ways in, in their lives, to, in ways that nurtured connection, meaning the opportunity to solve problems together, uh, communities that trust each other, and, uh, and know who each other is. So can a swim class do that for you? And why is that different than, you know, like, I don't know how many people, well, the biggest people get together in Zumba and go have a coffee afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I mean, can something's magical is happening here that's a little yeah. different. So can you engineer that? Can you create classes? What's that thought process? I, Leslie, I'd just like to add, if I may, um, what I think, in li especially living in a big city, it's really hard. You can get very disconnected and in your own world and feel like it's the enemy, uh, you know, on this side. And I've found if you're feeling good about yourself, it's much easier to be generous, to, 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 mm -hmm. to bridge to another human being, because it's a whole world in front of you, another human being. And I, I remember one story, but I think people in service service businesses, they can have a really rough time with the public. And I was in a cab, and the, I asked the cab driver to roll up the window, and he just was really grumpy, and he said, oh, like this, and he rolled up the window. And I, I said, oh my God, okay, now I have a moment, I have a New York moment. Do I reach out to him, or do I just stay <laughs> quiet, you know? So I just said, Let go, Dale. So I said, I said, Wow, did, th did that upset you that I asked oh. you to roll out the window? So now I'm making a bridge to him, you know? And he said, well, yeah. Like, like, I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. It sounds like you're having a really hard day. And he said, I am. And, I, and he proceeded to tell me his day, <laughs> the entire trip. And it was horrible. I mean, <laughs> his day was horrible. He had every right, do you know? And at the very end, you know, I paid. And I said, look, I can't really help you, but I give you my support in, for, for your day at the very end. And he, I paid, I walked out, closed the door, and he didn't move off. I got me really nervous. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> and then he, he turned around and he said, lady, lady. And I turned around and I said, I said, yes. And he said, will you do one thing for me? And I said, if I can. And he, said, <laughs> he said, will you pray for me? Oh. I went, oh, oh my Dale. God. <laughs> Oh, and that's Dale. just that decision, do you know, to make that bridge connection. and to make that connection. To this day, I remember that man. I mean, I could get teary about it because it was so human, you know, and I'm human, he's human. We made human together, you know? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, thank you. Dr. Freed, do you want to talk about Governor Hochul? I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Hochul. Hochul. I see. I've left New York and I can't even pronounce her name anymore. <laughs> to implement what, what you're working on to implement some structures like these, like, you know, sure. so various Governor interventions. Governor Hochul actually has created um, a committee of several hundred people all across New York State to design a master plan on aging to say, OK, we're living longer lives. How do we build a state that will support people flourishing uh, in older age as well as younger ages? The thing that's novel about this is that 11 other states have created master plans on aging. New York State, to her credit, is the only state that is actually commissioned building a whole agenda on wellness and prevention and well-being which is very exciting, and it's what we're talking about here. Right, right. And so I, I have the privilege of working on this, and um, I am optimistic that this will roll out a, a lot of recommendations on how we actually solve loneliness and isolation 
for people at older ages, but if we do that for people at older ages, we will build the programs that solve it for everybody. Right, right. So I have one last question for Dr. Pollan um, before we go on. People in the pool become family, is what one of the um, people in the pool said. Can we really make our own families? And is that a solution? I think you definitely can. I think the group of people who made this film made a family. Aww. I think you can do it with people that you go roller skating with or bicycle with. I think it is a choice that people make. And it, it's based, again, on trust and kindness. But I think you can. And if you, look at, if you just look at the people who make TV shows and when they stop you know, after 10 seasons, they all talk about losing their family. Oh, yeah. I think whether you come from a good family that's a nuclear family and you've been raised beautifully, I don't think that's the end of it. I think you can make your family, but you have to want to do it. You have to, you know, as Dale has said and Linda, you have to want to do it. You have to go out and try and bring people together. And to go back to your first question about why did the Aquafit class do it, it's because of Patty. It's because of individuals, oh, individuals. who want to make people come together. And I think it's, it's kind of like an ice crystal or a snowflake. There's a central crystal that happens, and then it all coalesces around it. And I think, yes, you can make your own family. So Patty is the hero of the and Patty, film. I think, is the centerpiece of this film. And she makes people want to come back because she cares about them. And it's not that she does anything extraordinary. Oh, she writes a card if they have a birthday or if they're sick. But she makes people want to come to her and smile. That's lovely. She, All right. She understands, just to touch on that, she understands that this is a primal human need. And um, she's very smart about it. Um, and it, that primal need can be you know, <laughs> used for uh, the need to you know, create meaning and uh, and connections, it's, um, it could be used for, for good, uh, great good, as she, as she, um, as she has uh, demonstrated. And she was doing it for something like 34 years? Yeah. Yes. Yes, amazing. All right, so we're gonna do some Q&A from the audience. So from Harrison Stern, who's a Paley Center member, his question is, what are some ways to entice elderly people to join a group like the Aquafit class seen in Below Surface? Who wants to jump in on that? I'm going to Go take ahead. the first stab on that. There are a lot of people in that class who've had knee surgery or hip surgery or shoulder surgery. They have a group of, of aquafitters in the warm pool at 85 degrees who don't do a lot of exercise. They just stretch. So you can tear the amount of effort it takes. And you can figure out who you want to attract. And I'll bet if you can do it with aquafit, you can do it with ice hockey, <laughs> roller skating, anything else where you have, you stage it. So you don't have to be an Olympic skater to do the skating. Anyone else want to Somebody jump else. in on that? OK, Dr. Fried. So uh, there are a million ways to do this, I think. Uh, the one way not to do it is that people who are lonely do not join things to meet other lonely people. Ah, okay. <laughs> they, join, they join things because they, they, there's something they want to do, and the thing they're joining offers the opportunity to do it, or it's something they need to do, as, as Mary Lake felt, or um, because it offers an opportunity to meet people with like interests. That's why people join things. And so the, they could be social. They could be for health. It could be for um, coming together to solve shared problems in the community and, and being able to tackle things you can't, solve, you can't solve solo. But all of those things, I think, if people understand it's there, they'll come. So we have to advertise for Aquafit, find your family, psychology, you know, psychological <laughs> counseling, whatever you want is all there, right? We just have to expand the idea of what it is. All right, here's another question from Lucy Tripper, a Paley member. 
Has the group in the film ever gotten together for activities outside of the YMCA? I can answer that yes, that I, I know they went to Dick's art opening, for example. Oh, that's great. And uh, you can answer more on that. At the Westport Library, Dick had a big show of his drawings, and people went to that. And they do. They, they have events. There's a whole, this is in Westport, Connecticut. There's a whole network of Senior Center, Westport Library, uh, YMCA, uh, the Paul Newman Theater. There's a whole group of things that happen there. And yes, they do go out and do things together. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's, yeah, that's great. Jim Stein, who's a Paley member, asks, what has been the best or most rewarding comment you've gotten from an elderly person about the film? It was interesting to see how many people wanted to sign up for Aquafit when it aired on the uh, AARP website. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, we, we got to see uh, you know, what seemed like hundreds, maybe even thousands of people saying, I'm going to si sign up uh, soon. So it was, um, I, d I do think. <coughs> changing ways people interact with media or things that they can see in their media universe uh, is, you know, is, the, is the solution to the previous question. And um, um, get, yeah. I will say that several, I have several friends, since I've been talking about this for about a year and a half, who have come back to me and said, you know, I'm doing Aquafit now. <laughs> and so I, you know, and I'm not really trying to proselytize. I think it could be anything that makes you feel better. The other thing that nobody's talked about so far with the Aquafit is it's got music. Oh. And so you can do a theme of an hour of show tunes. Or on the 4th of July, you can do Bruce Springsteen. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with music. So that helps with the, the emotional, the, really the, the way it works and how people like it, because there's music. So you have exercise, you have water, and you have music. Hmm, very interesting. Have they changed since, um, you know, since they've become famous? Or <laughs> do they have, are they all, are they all got their Instagram accounts and their influencer, water influencers? We have one of the Aquafit people here tonight. We do? But Linda. Oh, okay. in the film, and I don't think she's changed. I don't think, it, I don't think it makes people change. I just think they get happier. Interesting. All right. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, everybody.